Yes. So welcome everybody to this week's autonomy talk. Uh, today we have Kirill Solovey. Um, Kirill is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University working with Professor Marco Pavone. Uh, before moving to California, Kirill obtained a PhD in computer science from the University of Tel Aviv, working with Professor Dan Alperin. And uh, he's wor he worked on many interesting subjects. Lately, he's working on the design of effective control and decision-making mechanism for multi-robot systems. And he focuses at the interface of computer science and uh, transportation science. Uh, as you can see from, from the bio I, I shared with you, we received a lot of awards for his work. Uh, I am citing some of them, the Clore Scholars and the Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellowships and some Best Paper Award uh, nominations at RSS, at ICRA, at the uh, European Control Conference, and I could go on. So Marco is calling him the Best Paper Award guy. I, I've heard this, this reference at some point, which is a good one. Today we talk about uh, large-scale multi-robot systems from algorithm foundations to smart mobility, and I'm really happy and interested in what he's going to talk about. So go ahead, Kirill. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Joelle. Um, I'm also very happy to, to join you. I didn't get a chance to visit at ETH yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that at least I have to, the opportunity to do that uh, virtually. Um, so today I'm going to present my ongoing work on uh, the operation and control of uh, large scale uh, multi robot systems. And for this talk, I would start with the very basics of uh, multi-robot systems, uh, whose tasks related to motion planning and task allocation. And from that, I will move to uh, more uh, large-scale applications where we apply those systems to smart mobility. And this is a very exciting uh, area of research. And of course, it will have a tremendous uh, uh, impact on, in our lives and um, talking about smart mobility in the next few years. And um, I'm really ha happy that we have the opportunity to think and, and uh, reason about those systems already now. And, and those introduce a lot of interesting challenges and opportunities. And, and besides the technological aspects, I will also try to give you some flavors and tastes of what, what kind of societal impacts those systems can have and how we can address them along the way. And um, with that, I um, just want to mention that if you have any questions or, or thoughts, please uh, feel free to jump in. Um, or if you feel more comfortable, you can just write put it in the chat. So with that, um, Multi-robot systems sounds like a very futuristic term, but in fact, we already have a lot of those systems uh, integrated in our lives in one way or another already today. And multi-robot systems are already used in agriculture, uh, inspection, and so on. But maybe the most common example for uh, those systems is what, whatever is happening in Amazon's uh, facilities. So every time uh, each one of you is pressing the buy now, now button in Amazon, uh, I, I presume that you have uh, already this option in, in Zurich right now, then um, you're essentially commanding a fleet of those uh, orange uh, robots to move in the warehouse and to, uh, to move around in the warehouse and, and take those shells from one uh, location to another. And uh, besides that, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next few years, we will see more applications of those systems applied to areas where uh, that are currently too dangerous uh, for, for, our, for us humans. And for instance, it would, would have been very useful if we had already uh, this year, those systems used in, to, to extinguish fires in the West Coast of the US. Unfortunately, this was not the case. But I think that in the next years, we will get closer and closer to such applications. But perhaps the most exciting and, um, and transformational uh, opportunity that those systems pose is in, uh, in smart mobility. 
I'm currently living in the Bay Area, and every once in a while when I go for a walk in my neighborhood, I would see one of those uh, weird vehicles mounted with so many sensors. And it won't be long before we will have uh, those uh, autonomous vehicles, entire fleets of, of uh, autonomous vehicles driving in our streets and uh, moving people around from their origins to their destinations. <clears throat> And of course, there are many, many benefits that are associated with those systems, ranging from uh, increased efficiency to safety, uh, even sustainability, and, and addressing uh, even equality. But the important thing to understand uh, when we're talking about uh, multi robot systems in general and uh, smart, smart mobility systems in particular is, is that. that in order to reap all the rewards associated with multi-robot systems, we must understand now how to uh, account or solve the challenging optimization problems that are introduced by those systems. The reason why those optimization problems are challenging is uh, it, has, it has quite a lot of, uh, of reasons, but the main ones are, first of all, when we're talking about uh, robotic systems, we need to account and capture the, the high dimensional search space, even of individual robots. And the situation gets even worse when we're, we need to, to also uh, and reason about uh, the interactions between the different robots in our system. Besides that, when we're moving to the real world, as in smart mobility, not only that the scale is huge, but we also need to account for the interaction of those systems with the real world. So for example, we need to understand how the, how uh, if we're talking about the case of vehicles, how those vehicles behave in terms of traffic flow and how passengers, the behavior of passengers, for example, affects the operation of our system. And more broadly, how those systems interact with the environment and the society. The, the last thing here that I want to mention is that we, we want to get to, to design approaches that have also strong theoretical guarantees because uh, we want to ensure that they are uh, quick enough to be run in real time. And the quality of the solution that they provide, for instance, is the best that we can get. So all of those considerations make the, the problem of designing control mechanism for those multi-robot systems uh, very challenging. <clears throat> so in my work, I, I, uh, I strive to design uh, effective co uh, control algorithms for uh, multi-robot systems. And to do that, I leverage techniques from the world of computer science, engineering, and most recently from uh, transportation sciences. So I want to take you through some of those uh, works that I developed recently in this area today. And what I'm going to do for the remainder of, of this talk is to start with the fundamentals of multi-robot systems, namely problems concerning uh, task allocation and motion planning. And from that, I move briefly and I'll describe briefly a recent uh, exciting application that we had in using those systems in the setting of uh, drone delivery, <clears throat> drone multi drone package delivery, where we have multiple drones that need to deliver packages across a large urban area. And the majority of, the, of this talk would be spent on um, applications of. Uh, autonomous uh, mobility on demand. We will talk on, on how to control um, effectively systems consisting of multiple autonomous vehicles to drive people around. And here I would highlight the, uh, the, the societal is, is issues and aspects of, of operating these systems as well. In the last part of this talk, uh, I will also go a little bit more into the algorithmic details and I will describe to you a recent um, algorithmic uh, result that we had on, on how to control those systems while accounting for congestion effects. <clears throat> so with that, um, I would like to start the remainder of this talk. <clears throat> uh, 
As a fresh and graduate student in uh, Tel Aviv University, I started to work on one of the most fundamental problems that you can think of that arise in operation of any multi-robot system, namely pl motion planning. So the problem is very simple. We have a, a fleet of robots that operate in, the sh in a shared environment. And given uh, origins and destinations for all the robots, we want to construct uh, a collection of paths for each individual robot such that each of them gets from its origin to its destination. And of course, the, ro the robots do not collide either with the static environment or with one another. And already on this level, this, this problem poses many, many challenges. It's very complex to solve actually in the real world. And very early in my research, I observed that there is an interesting and useful connection between this continuous multi-robot motion planning problem that we have on the left and uh, a puzzle-like uh, problem uh, that many of you have probably had a chance to, to play with or at least get frustrated from. And I'm talking here about uh, this uh, puzzle that we see on the right which is a, a generalization of this, uh, of the 15 puzzle problem. So by leveraging this connection uh, together with my advisor back then and a few more collaborators, in a sequence of works, we developed algorithmic tools for motion planning that uh, cast this continuous problem into a sequence of puzzle-like uh, problems and the, the benefit of that is that we can solve those discrete problems very efficiently. And by that, solve uh, the initial problem with which we actually started. And even in many cases, guarantee uh, completeness, um, optimality, and uh, scalability. And in fact, th th some of those papers that you mentioned on this slide are one of the most um, scalable approaches that we have today for multi-robot systems. With that said, and due to the specific techniques and tools that we used in the design of those uh, approaches, and the algorithms are, those algorithms are currently applicable to relatively simple uh, robotic systems, uh, which are also bounded to work in the two-dimensional space. So in order to be able to uh, design approaches that are applicable to wider range of uh, robotic systems, I realized that I need to study and understand better how we, how we should motion plan uh, for a single individual robot. And for that, I turned to study sampling-based planners. And so sampling-based planners, the, the, the main idea behind them is that they avoid constructing the explicitly the high dimensional configuration space of, uh, of a single robot and instead uh, attempt to capture the connectivity of this space via random sampling. And <clears throat> due to the very uh, basic ingredients that are required to implement those algorithms, namely uh, collision detection and nearest neighbor search, they can be applied to a wider variety of systems. And here with my collaborators, we developed a few new approaches for uh, new algorithms for something that's motion planning for an individual robot, and also help to lay uh, theoretical foundations to analyze uh, those uh, algorithms. For instance, when those algorithms are guaranteed to find a solution, to what kind of systems do those are applicable, when are we guaranteed to find a solution that uh, is close to the optimum? And how many samples do we need to produce and where to put them? So we, nowadays we have quite a good understanding of all of those questions. So armed with this understanding of how to plan for an individual robot, uh, together with my collaborators, we designed a method methodology for multi-robot motion planning where we, we show that we can combine in an effective manner those motion uh, sampling based roadmaps uh, constructed for individual robots 
to, uh, to yield a more complex old map that captures also the interactions between the uh, multiple robots together. <clears throat> and in this area, we, we actually were managed to, uh, to design and to propose uh, to present the first scalable approach for sampling based multi robot motion planning. <clears throat> Besides motion planning, of course, we have other uh, other ingredients that are necessary in virtually any multi-robot uh, system. One of them is uh, task allocation. In, in task allocation, as the as the name of the problem suggests, uh, we need to uh, distribute uh, resources and tasks between the individual robots of our fleet in order to. Uh, to effectively solve a problem in which those multiple robots strive toward uh, uh, a shared goal. So for instance, in a recent uh, collaboration with uh, NAFSA JPL, we uh, tackled a problem that is motivated by a recent, uh, by a future NASA application where they're pl planning to use multiple uh, heterogeneous satellites to study the surface of uh, Mars and um, and for that specific problem, we were able to design um, polynomial time. Well, for a problem that is motivated by this application, we were able to design a polynomial time polynomial time algorithm that has only also uh, strong theoretical guarantees on the solution quality. In general, I would mention that it's typically the case that every task allocation problem is different from one another, so it is it's quite difficult to design an approach that applies to all of those uh, variations. But in many cases, as, as, as I mentioned in, the, in this recent paper, there is some structure that we can leverage from uh, the specific problem that we're going to solve in the design of effective um, algorithms and control mechanisms for, for those problems. In, uh, in a recent paper, we're combining our expertise in motion planning and routing of large multi-robot systems with uh, these task allocation uh, mechanisms. And, um, and this is a joint work with uh, Shishman Chaudhary, uh, Michael Kochendrefer, and uh, Marco Pavone. The motivation for this project was um, that uh, um, package delivery services, uh, standard package delivery services like uh, delivery trucks uh, incredibly overburden our uh, road networks. And, and many companies have already started to consider the use of uh, drones for package delivery to, to overcome this, uh, this uh, limitation. But there is still a large, a huge problem with uh, currently with the delivery drones, especially when they're carrying a large uh, package which is that they're very limited in terms of their flight range. So the, to overcome this, we, um, we propose a, a novel framework which uh, utilizes uh, pub existing public transit infrastructure uh, to increase the, uh, the service range of drones. So in particular, in this project, we um, we are using uh, um, multi, multi drone systems uh, for package delivery in a way that allows those drones to land on top of uh, public transit vehicles such as buses and, uh, and trains. So, so essentially drones can hitchhike and hop between different uh, vehicles to, and, and that's why, this way to conserve their uh, uh, limited battery. So the, the, the problem here is how do we assign tasks, uh, sorry, assign packages uh, to multiple drones and, uh, and plan the routes of those drones, which combine both the use of public transit as well as uh, flight modes in a way that um, um, minimizes the delivery of, uh, of 
of the packages that we have to deliver over a, a large urban area. For that, we design an efficient algorithmic approach. That maybe if you don't have time in the end of this, this talk, I can go a little bit more into details. I want to show you a, a very a simple visualization that we did in, in this work. So <clears throat> here we uh, here we can see how, how such a system would would work in on a city like San Francisco. So for the simulations, we used a real uh, public transit networks that were already used in San Francisco. And the, let me restart that. The circles that you see here are the drones where the color indicates, for instance, if it's red, whether the drone sits on a, on a bus or blue that it's currently in flight mode. And as you can see from this visualization, um, our algor algorithmic approach can deal with quite a large number of uh, drones simultaneously. For instance, we're using as much as 200 drones uh, in some of the simulations. And another interesting uh, observation that we get from the simulations is that at least in the cities of San Francisco and Washington DC, using such an approach, we can uh, extend the service range of uh, drones by as much as two or four times, which is quite a lot. Uh, I guess that this is a good time to see if you have any questions before I move to the uh, next and main part of uh, this talk. So if you, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. Okay. So for the main, remainder of this talk, I want to talk about uh, the very fundamental problem that I'm sure many of you in, in Professor Frazoli's group have uh, worked on, uh, which is the, the control of autonomous mobility on demand. So the, the basic problem is that you're operating a service like Uber and Lyft, but which is completely autonomous consists of multiple, multiple, many, many vehicles that are scattered over a large urban area. And we also have a demand that uh, describes how passengers are interested in traveling between their origin and destination. And the question is, how do we operate this system in the most efficient manner? And for, for now, we'll just talk about um, minimizing the total travel time of uh, of driving those vehicles, which corresponds to the oper operational cost of those systems. Now, of course, an, an important uh, component or important aspect that we must account for when we are tackling this problem is that those systems, because of their scale, we will, they will have many, many vehicles uh, would actually interfere and introduce congestion. So individual vehicles in the system might increase travel times for other vehicles. And we want to capture this property. So essentially we want to ensure that the controllers that we design are congestion aware. <clears throat> and I want to walk for you from, for, uh, a uh, recent uh, result that we had in this uh, area. This is uh, joint work with Mauro Salazar and Marco Bertone. And here we demonstrated by exploiting the unique problem structure of uh, autonomous mobility on demand, uh, we can develop an effective approach that is uh, congestion aware. So from the theoretical perspective, we show that our approach is guaranteed to minimize the total travel time of the vehicles in the system while accounting for their congestion effects. From the practical perspective, the approach is, is capable of solving massive problems. And for example, the entire uh, rush hour demand of Manhattan in just a few seconds on the commodity laptop. And, and in fact, it is faster than previous works that are either congestion aware or unaware by several orders of magnitude. And 
from a mathematical perspective, this problem can be viewed as a convex program. So that we can represent the aim or the outing problem as a convex program, but this in itself is not enough because just plugging this uh, convex representation of the problem into a convex solver would yield running times of what on the order of hours, which is unacceptable in our applications. So the main mathematical insight that we obtain in this work is that we can transform the AMOD routing problem into a slightly simpler uh, problem called traffic assignment. And I will go in a little bit more into details of exactly what it means traffic assignment later on. This is still a convex program, but it has a very special structure. <clears throat> in particular, when we apply to the traffic assignment problem a, a gradient descent approach, then every linearization step of, uh, of this uh, of of, of this specific problem essentially breaks into a sequence of shortest stack queries. So instead of solving in a linear, linear program in every linearization step, which can take a lot of time in our setting because we're dealing with a very large uh, problem instance, instead we can solve multiple shortest path queries, which we can do very efficiently nowadays. So essentially we are breaking this convex uh, complex convex program that we have on the left, AMOD routing, into multiple shortest path queries. This allows us to achieve the, those very uh, fast uh, practical guarantees. So now I want to walk you a little bit more through the details of uh, this approach. First of all, the problem itself can be represented as a the input of the problem can be represented as a discrete graph where uh, we have uh, edges that represent road segments and uh, vertices are either intersections or locations in which passenger demands, uh, demand emerges. And of course, for that, we have also characterization of the passenger demand, namely how many people are interested in traveling between every pair of uh, two vertices. <clears throat> and our goal is to design or specify the routes that the different vehicles take for the system to satisfy the demand and also ensure the rebalancing of the system. That is that we don't, that we uh, ensure that vehicles do not accumulate in vertices and instead empty vehicles would go uh, and pick up the next passenger. <clears throat> Now, I highlighted earlier the importance of accounting for congestion effects when we're tackling, uh, when designing controllers for those systems. The way that we are capturing congestion effects is through the use of a travel time function that is assigned for every edge. So in particular, for every edge in this graph, we have a function that associated with it that tells us given the traffic volume over the edge, what would be the travel time over the edge? And this function behaves very naturally because as we increase the traffic volume, so does the travel time over the edge increase. And it increases until a certain point where it starts to increase very rapidly, which represents the onset of uh, congestion. And the, this is a, a classical way to capture congestions in, um, in the context of uh, transportation sciences, and it has been used in, in quite a large variety of works. Of course, this, approach, uh, this way to model congestion has the benefit of uh, being uh, relatively easy to compute, but it also has some disadvantages because it still suffers from uh, and accuracy issues uh, when, when it is used in the real world. And uh, I would like to mention that we're currently also working on uh, several extensions that allow to capture more realistic uh, travel flow functions. But here in this specific, uh, in, the, in the description that I have, 
In the next few slides, we will use this travel for time uh, function. Okay, so I already mentioned earlier that given all those ingredients, we can represent the problem, uh, the AMOE routing problem as a convex program where the goal of this program is to minimize the total travel time of all the vehicles. In particular, um, for every edge, we multiply the number of vehicles along the edge, which is Xe for edge E, times the travel time of the vehicles along the edge, which is in itself the, a function of the traffic volume Xe again. And this gives us the travel time, total travel time of all the vehicles for a specific edge. And we sum it over all the edges that we have in our graph. And of course, in addition to that, we also have linear constraints. So the, the first constraint uh, is essentially a constraint that uh, specifies that we need to ensure the uh, conservation of passenger flow, namely that every passenger starts its trip in its origin and reaches its destination. In addition to that, we also have a, a more tricky constraint to reason about, which is the conservation of rebalancing flow constraint, which specifies that empty vehicles need to, or what, is, what are the routes that empty vehicles would take to, uh, to rebalance the system in, in a way that they end up in the uh, origin nodes of uh, passengers. Now, the reason why this second constraint is more complex to capture is that we, for empty vehicles, we do not know a priori where exactly they need to go because there are many different options. For, for example, if we take the empty vehicle that comes here, uh, goes from the left side, <clears throat> it may end up in each and one of those uh, passenger origins, it's just that we don't know currently where, uh, where it should go just from looking at, uh, at the demand. And this makes this uh, problem a little bit more tricky to, to solve. <clears throat> now, I just want to mention that the, the solution that we're getting for this problem is a vector X which specifies for every vehicle, what, is, what are the edges that it takes along the way to reach its either passenger or uh, destination of the passenger. Okay, so this was the, here I described to you the AMOD routing problem. And I already mentioned earlier that we're exploiting some structure that allows us to transform the aim of the routing problem into a similar or closely related traffic assignment problem. And I, and I want to describe how this uh, reduction works. So for that, I want to, to introduce to you what is the traffic assignment problem. So here we have the Newton formulation of the traffic assignment problem, which is very similar to what we had earlier in the setting of the aim of the routing. The only difference is, so first of all, the goal function is exactly the same. And we also have uh, this first constraint on conservation of passenger flow. The difference is that in this formulation of traffic assignment problem, we don't have uh, constraints of uh, conservation of rebalancing flow. So essentially this setting represents the case where we have multiple passengers where each one has its own uh, vehicle. And we only need to specify what are the routes <clears throat> that those uh, uh, passenger driven vehicles take. And because those vehicles are privately owned, we don't need to worry about rebalancing uh, the system. So now the question here is, how can we transform the previous setting that a the routing problem into this uh, new formulation in a way that we can still ensure the rebalancing of our system. So 
Now I want to describe to you what is this induction that we're doing. <clears throat> So first of all, just by looking at the demand and the, the formulation of, of this problem, we know that we don't need to worry anymore uh, about ensuring the first constraint, which is uh, conservation of uh, passenger flow, because this is what what uh, this is part of the traffic assignment problem. Now, what do we do about rebalancers? Here we notice just by looking at the characterization of the problem that we would have empty vehicles accumulating in the uh, in the free left uh, vertices. And what we are going to do from now on, we can essentially think about those empty vehicles that would be accumulated here as if they were a new passenger demand in the traffic assignment problem. Now, the thing is that in the traffic assignment problem, every passenger demand has its own unique origin and destination. And for now, we don't know a priori where those empty vehicles would need to end up. But we can overcome this. In particular, we can introduce a virtual node which would represent the rebalancing destination node. And we would connect this uh, vertex through every, each of those origin uh, vertices for the passenger, for the or original passenger demand. So essentially for this new type of demand for the empty vehicles, we can think about them as if they were uh, passengers having their own vehicles in the traffic assignment problem that are uh, interested in going between those three vertices to this specific uh, rebalancing destination node. Now, the question still remains, how do we ensure that those vehicles are rebalanced in the correct manner? For instance, we want to avoid situations where all of those three vehicles would decide to rebalance this specific uh, green demand. So for that, what we are doing, we, we can adjust the travel time function that is associated with those red edges that we just introduced in a way that we ensure also the rebalancing of the system. <clears throat> Moreover, in the paper we show, we prove mathematically that we can uh, characterize the cost of those new edges in a way that we are not only ensuring the rebalancing of the system, but we're, by solving this new traffic assignment problem, we will get an optimal solution for the AMOD routing problem. So just to understand what, what it means to route an empty vehicle from one vertex to from its origin vertex to the rebalancing node, let's, let's look at the yellow path that was uh, in, introduced for this specific vehicle. So we, we only need to look where it, what is the last uh, real vertex that it uh, visits before getting to the empty, the virtual rebalancing node. And this vertex would give us, would tell us what is the demand that it rebalances in the formulation of the MOD routing problem. So again, using this formulation, by solving the traffic assignment problem for, for the new version that we just described, we will get an optimal solution for the MOD routing problem. So now it's still, the question remains, what, what is the benefit of using this new traffic assignment formulation? And I'm going to describe to you what, what happens under the hood when we're applying a gradient descent approach uh, over the, the new traffic assignment formulation that they just described. In particular, so Fankul algorithm is one of the most uh, basic algorithms that we have for uh, convex programming, and it has a very unique property that when, when it's used in traffic assignment problem. So the way that general gradient descent approaches work, they find in every step K, they find uh, uh, some solution, some feasible solution to the problem. And then we, to find the next 
next solution, we linearize the function around the previous solution. And then for this uh, new linearization, we find the next best solution by k and we go towards it. And to find the, the, this new yk candidate, uh, we need to solve a linearization of the problem. And this is usually where most of the running time of the algorithm uh, is coming from. And I won't go into more, all of the details, but just to clarify what is happening when we're solving the linearization step, essentially to, to solve the linearization step, we need to minimize the expression that we have on, on the above. It is uh, minimizing the gradient of uh, the goal function as a function of the previous solution, xk, times the new solution. This is yk is, is the new value that we want to find. And the thing is that if you write down the math of what it means to, to optimize this expression, so we know how the gradient of the function looks like, it is equivalent to minimizing the expression uh, sum over all edges times the new solution for every edge, yk of e, times the travel time along the edge as a function of the previous solution. So this function looks very similar to the original goal function that we had in traffic assignment. But the difference is that now the travel time is no longer affected by the new solution that we're going to find for this new step. And this essentially means that uh, by accounting also for the, the uh, passenger flow constraint, that we only need to solve multiple shortest path queries for each one, uh, of the individual demands that we have. <clears throat> now, the last thing I want to mention in this context is that still finding the shortest paths in large transportation networks, especially when you're doing it multi, multi, many, many times, can take still quite a lot of running time. So here we're using a recent uh, method that was designed by a group for, from Council that allows to solve shortest path queries uh, very quickly, specifically for transportation networks. And nowadays we're looking into several extensions of this approach to capture more, uh, uh, more advanced technologies such as uh, um, charging and battery capacities as well as uh, ride sharing and improved uh, traffic flow models. Now, the, the important thing that we're still not capturing in, in this formulation is the behavior of the passengers. And this is essentially the, one of the first ingredients that we need to think about when we're designing uh, uh, controllers. We know from economics that the, the demand for a commodity is usually dependent on the quality of the service that it provides. So for example, in our case, it might be that as we uh, design more and more effective controllers for our system, we will only increase the demand for our service. And we would like to capture this phenomenon in our, uh, in, in our models. So we're currently working on a formulation that extends the previous uh, algorithmic method that I just described uh, with, um, with a setting that captures elasticity of uh, uh, passenger demand. After we, we will tame this, uh, this ingredient, we're, we're hoping to understand better the entire ecosystem that consists of, uh, of passengers that behave selfishly, an operator of an AMOD system, and the municipality that operates the tra public transit system. <clears throat> More broadly, it is, it is also important to capture in our optimization objectives and broader societal goals such as fairness and accessibility. 
The thing is that, that if we are just striving to optimize the solution quality in terms of travel time or operational cost, we may get uh, solutions that from the perspective of individual users of those systems are highly unfair. For instance, we can get a situation where two different uh, travelers that come from the same origins to the same destinations would have vastly different travel times. So in a recent uh, project, an ongoing project with, uh, that was initiated by Devash Jalota in our group, we're <clears throat> aiming to strike a balance between the quality of the service that we provide, the efficiency of the system, and the level of fairness that we can guarantee with this system. And this here is a very interesting optimization and problem that we're currently working on. Even more and more broadly in the future, we, we would like to understand how we can balance between the amount of uh, benefits that the users of the system get and the level of this utility that residents or the society as a whole um, uh, incurs uh, from, from the AMOD system. <clears throat> The last thing that I want to mention is that even though there is a still long way to go before we actually see uh, the implementation of AMOD systems in, in the real world, some of the observations and, uh, and insights that we gain along the way uh, can already be useful today to inform policy makers and operators of ride hailing services. For example, in a recent uh, paper, this is ongoing work with the Center of Automotive Research at Stanford, we are developing an operation and a regulatory framework to address wheelchair accessibility. So in particular, we're designing a tool that is based on queuing theory that would inform uh, policymakers and ride hailing operators on what should be the the composition of uh, ride hailing fleet in terms of the number of wheelchair accessible vehicles versus uh, standard vehicles. <clears throat> so with that, I would like to conclude this talk. We started with very basic applications of, uh, or very basic aspects of uh, multi-robot systems, namely motion planning and uh, task allocation. And we moved gradually towards more challenging and large scale systems uh, in uh, smart mobility. And along the way, I highlighted the importance of accounting and taking into consideration, not only how do we get an efficient solution or use of the systems, but also how we can address and overcome uh, various societal issues that are currently present in our current uh, transportation uh, systems. So with that, I would like to thank all the um, collaborators that I mentioned uh, for all this work and especially uh, Dan Halperin, with, who was my advisor in uh, Tel Aviv University, Kurtos Becker is one of my uh, uh, biggest collaborators and of course, Marco Pavone, who is my host in uh, Stanford. Yeah. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your uh, um, patience and uh, I would now take all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill, for the great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? No question. Um, Okay, I'll go with one. I, I have a couple, but uh, I'll go with one. Maybe then somebody <laughs> takes the courage to ask something. Yeah, uh, it's more, it's just a curiosity or detail. Um, when you showed your um, congestion aware approach, um, at some point you mentioned this this way of getting rid of this constraint about, um, about uh, the rebalancing, right? Mm -hmm. And, but when you formulate the objective, I see um, the minimization of the travel time as a whole. And my, my curiosity or question was, are you minimizing then the, the travel time for all vehicles or, or just for the vehicles that are uh, servicing some customers? 
So are you yeah. minimizing both the travel times or just the ones of, of the customers you are servicing? Yeah, we're, we're currently minimizing the travel time of all the vehicles, even, even those who are not carrying a passenger, um, which in a way is um, corresponds to the operational cost. But I do agree with you, there is, it, it is a bit um, unnatural to, it, it doesn't, it's not, uh, entirely clear why you would like to minimize the travel time of the empty vehicle. It's just that it's um, essentially a surrogate for the operational cost. The thing is that through the specific approach that we're designing, we, we, we can only do it in this way. We cannot ignore the travel times of the empty vehicle. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, because I had the same issue with some, with the work some while ago. So I, I was wondering for that reason, but also I, I think with all the new laws you have that you cannot be empty as a car for too much time. I think you, you can also explain it that way. It's, it's okay. Mm. And, and the second question was about the elastic demand work. So, um, maybe, I, I, so, so maybe you cannot talk too much about that because it's, uh, it's a long discussion, but it's, um, I wanted to understand if you're considering the elasticity in the terms of in absolute terms. So meaning, um, how many people, or also in terms of the diversity of, of the interests of the different customers. I don't know, maybe somebody wants to minimize costs, somebody wants to minimize time, and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the great question, uh, uh, Joelle. Um, <clears throat> the thing, we, we're currently uh, considering the, the case where we're just optimizing for uh, the so the elasticity comes from the price. We are assigning prices to the service and then passengers behave uh, according to those prices. We don't know currently how to combine between prices and travel times, unless these are uh, the, there is a, a one proportion that applies to all the different passengers. But what we can do is that we, ha we can have different passengers that have different um, ways that they uh, uh, value money. So we might have two uh, passengers coming from the same origin and destination, but they will have different behaviors because they value money in a different way. So this is something that we already know how to do. Okay, very interesting, thank you. So basically you, you have different ways to model the reaction to, to these prices. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay very interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I can share more details after after the talk with that if you. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that that would be great. Yes. Are there any other questions from the audience? Kirill, I'm curious if you have applied um, uh, your algorithms to um, you know like real data sets and uh, <laughs> uh, try to analyze the effect on cities, for example, of uh, congestion. Um, if, if you are referring to the to the AMOD routing paper, then yeah. we we used we used data sets of Manhattan, but we didn't we didn't go go uh, real really into the details of exactly how 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 much do we improve travel times in the city. Mm -hmm. um, no, this is something that we we haven't done yet. Okay. Because it's kind of like an open question, right? So, you know, what is the impact of these systems on on congestion, right? So, uh, yeah, you do have more vehicle miles traveled, but, you know, not all vehicles miles traveled are, are the same, right? So you may use um, underutilized capacity and things like that. So this is something that I've always been very curious about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely. Uh, it, it's important, especially to understand, especially now that we know that services like Uber and Lyft are actually increasing travel times in our cities because they introduce more congestion. And it's important to understand. Right. Whether so, yeah. so is that necessary, right? So is that unavoidable or there are ways that you can actually make things better, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so sorry for the noise, I'm just going music. Emilio can ask questions and park at the same time. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, definitely. Those are really interesting questions. Are, are there any closing remarks from, from or questions from somebody? Because if not, I think you, uh, Kirill, shared his, uh, his contacts. So you are free to reach him if, if you have more, let's say, deeper questions. And if not, uh, I thank you all for the participation. Thank you, Kirill, for giving this, this great talk. And I'll see you all um, this week. On Wednesday, we will have another autonomy talk by Dr. Saverio Bolognani. So if you're interested, just, just see you on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirill. Thank you all. It was thank, a you. Pleasure. thank you. Thank you, Kirill. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.